explaining the digital welfare state. I'm Tanya Hall, and joining me is Christian Van Veen, the director of the Digital Welfare State and the Human Rights Project at the New York University School of Law. Welcome, Christian. Thanks for having me. Give us a brief summary of your professional background up to this point. So I've been the director of the Digital Welfare State and Human Rights Project since uh, mid-2019. Uh, before that, I worked as an advisor on the mandate of the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights. And I've also been an attorney in the Netherlands working on um, telecom regulation and antitrust law. Explain the concept, if you will, behind the digital welfare state and what is it and what makes it digital? This really came out of a visit that I undertook together with the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights to the United Kingdom in uh, November of 2018. What we were looking at there was uh, a massive transformation, both on the policy side and on the IT side of uh, Britain's post-war welfare system. And uh, what we noticed was that uh, through that reform, which included um, uh, in interacting with the government online first, uh, automating a lot of uh, uh, back-end procedures within uh, the British welfare system, uh, that the traditional welfare states that we uh, encounter in, uh, in Europe and in the US and, and elsewhere since basically the Second World War were undergoing quite a radical transformation as a result of the introduction of new technologies, as, an, uh, as a result of an increasing reliance on, uh, on data. And, uh, and that development is what we termed uh, the digital welfare state, a welfare state that is changed in many ways uh, through the introduction of new technologies and, uh, and data. Is the UK where the digital welfare state got its start? For us it did, yes. But I definitely think that the UK is uh, not unique in that sense and that other countries, whether it's the US or the Netherlands where I'm from or a country like Australia have also experimented in their welfare systems with, for instance, automating decision-making uh, with the use of, uh, of, of technology. But the UK was a very good example because, um, as I said, this was not just a minor reform, not a minor tweak to the system. It was a major uh, reform, both on the policy side and on the technology side. So you should imagine that in the UK, for instance, where before um, you applied at a job center or you applied uh, for benefits on paper, uh, now you have to do most of that uh, via an online account. You then have to communicate with your um, um, caseworker uh, online as well. And on top of that, in order for that system to work in, this, in the first place, because it's basically a merging of six existing benefits into one, the government had to automate a lot of its data streams. For instance, reporting on income uh, to uh, the Treasury Department had to be compared with the income that someone received from the Social Security. Uh, department. So there was a, a lot of technology involved in, in that. And the implications of those developments uh, for individual rights, especially of, of, of poor and more uh, vulnerable in, uh, individuals, has been quite dramatic, uh, as we found. And that's the case in the UK, but it has also been the case uh, in other countries that we looked at uh, in, in relation to these phenomena. In what countries do you find that digital welfare states greatest use today? And in, in, in when you say greatest use, you mean uh, positive examples of its use, or uh, do you mean where those phenomena are most prevalent? I would say either, um, specifically where I think the phenomenon is most prevalent, but also where you're able to, to help. Right, right. I think um, from the perspective of uh, governments, there's a big promise uh, from the use of technology and data. And uh, I think what governments are looking for most is first and, all, first and foremost um, uh, savings and efficient, efficiency gains. So how can we make the system work better uh, from the government's perspective? So a lot of investments have been made in basically streamlining internal uh, data exchange, uh, decision making, et cetera. Uh, on the other hand, it's being sold, these digital welfare state developments, uh, as being in the interest of citizens because it becomes easier to interact with governments. Uh, the idea being that you can communicate quite easily from your home uh, with a welfare authority online. And so you see a lot of investments being made in, let's say, client portals, uh, citizen portals. 
and, and, and finally, I think a lot of investment has been made in uh, identifying um, uh, wrongdoing, for instance, benefit fraud, and the government see, uh, governments see a lot of potential in using, for instance, artificial intelligence in uh, better sifting through existing uh, data that they hold and the private uh, companies hold to identify who might be uh, trying to defraud uh, welfare systems. And so I think in all those three areas, you see a lot of uh, developments. What you see far less, and that's one of our concerns, is that there are um, much more, let's say, positive uses of technology, but they have been underexplored. And uh, that is mostly for uh, political reasons, not because the technology would not enable, for instance, to better identify uh, who is at risk of falling through the cracks of the system, uh, but it's more a question of many governments not having any political will uh, to let their IT experts go in that direction. Uh, so I'm not saying that technology is at fault in many of these uh, situations, not at all. I, I'm, I'm definitely a believer in the potential benefits of, uh, of the use of technology, but just that in many cases, um, it has been used for, let's say, um, more, uh, more negative reasons. And one thing to elaborate, elaborate on slightly, and that relates to our visit to the UK, is that there's been, um, I think, uh, an overly open, optimistic uh, assessment by governments, including in the UK, of the level of di digital literacy and digital access uh, that people have. For you and I, it might be quite easy to communicate via Zoom or um, uh, via our iPhones, uh, but quite a lot of people in the UK and, and in the US, the same applies. For instance, do not even have internet access at home or um, uh, are not comfortable filling out forms online, do not do any online banking, for instance, or online shopping. That's hard for some of us to uh, imagine, uh, but for people with literacy issues, uh, with people, for people with language uh, barriers, people with a migrant background, for instance, for older people, it's definitely not that easy to communicate with your government online, and many of them would actually prefer to speak to someone face-to-face. Uh, well, even those of us who use technology quite often sometimes prefer to talk to somebody face to face. I know Absolutely. I do many times. So, but whether we like it or not, right? Machine learning, artificial intelligence, algorithms, they're all going to play a part in our lives moving forward. And it's, it's to your point, that level of who's, who's more interested or more adept and more able to, to use these technologies. Then what I would, what I would want to know from you, then what kind of advice, if you will, can, can you offer to those people who are building these systems, whether it's for the tech savvy or for, for those who are really trying to understand technology uh, at, the, at this forefront? What, 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 what exactly. kind of advice can you offer? Well, let me say first and foremost that um, I, I completely understand that a lot of the developers working for government, for instance, are making a, their best effort in designing these systems uh, to be as user friendly as they can be, uh, to be as uh, conscious of, of, of rights and ethical implications of, of their work. But obviously they're limited by the, the, the environment in which they work. So in other words, if the government tells you uh, build a system that includes these and these and these features, um, often you cannot really go beyond that mandate. So understand that even technologists have, uh, have their limits in terms of what they can uh, achieve. I think one of the major issues here, and there was just a court decision in the Netherlands last week that we were involved in, uh, involving a tool that was built to detect benefit fraud in the Dutch welfare system. And it was basically taking data from different government authorities, bringing it together in one place and analyzing it using an algorithmic risk model. One of the things that the court said in that case, and they, they stopped that system uh, for violation of, uh, of privacy norms, uh, they said, we cannot really properly do our work as a court because we actually don't understand how this system works. And that was in part because uh, the risk indicators used, the exact data used, uh, the risk model itself uh, were not made public by, uh, by the government and by um, uh, people working on it within uh, government. And so transparency is a, a, a key uh, element in this debate. And I think how developers can help is to be an advocate within the organization for openness, uh, using open standards, but also uh, publicizing uh, their work, uh, pressuring, pressuring internally uh, to make more information about systems available. But I fully realize there's limits to what technologists can do. Obviously, they, they operate within the business or within the government, and they obviously have to 
uh, stay within their uh, lane. So I think it's not just the responsibility of those working on these issues directly, it's a broader responsibilities of governments, of the public, of media, uh, to address this uh, glaring transparency gap. Thank you so much for your time and thanks for joining us. It's Christian, Christian Van Veen, Director of Digital Welfare State and the Human Rights Project at the New York University School of Law. If somebody wants to connect with you, Christian, what's the best way they can do that? I think on Twitter would be best, at CPJ Van Veen. Sounds good. Thanks again. And if you want to guys want to find more of my interviews, you can do that right here or go to tanyahall.net. Thanks for watching.